Today we're talking about how I feed ball pythons. We're going to discuss prey sizes, feeding frequency, how, why, when, where. By viewer request, we're talking about snake food. Welcome to the green room. I'm Bob Bledsoe. This is Lucille, an example of a snake who eats food. Behind the camera, as you may know, is my brother Kent. Kent, pop question for you. What do ball pythons eat? People. Nope. Dogs and cats. Any household pet. Also people. Kent, you know this one. You've been learning how to thaw out frozen... Oh yeah, rats. There it is. Rodents. You stuff them with rats to keep their thirst for human flesh at bay. Nope. We've got a lot to cover. The questions that I get the most have to do with feeding. And so we're probably going to make this a two or three part video because this is a big topic and I could talk for days on it. Uh, and one thing that I try to do with these videos is not talk for days. I'm not always successful at it, I know. Uh, but let's get started. What do ball pythons eat? Rats. Unless they don't eat rats. Unless they eat mice and won't take a rat. Lucille, do you hear me talking about you? That's right, Lucille, my 1800 gram pied breeder female is a mouser. She does not recognize rats as food. I'm gonna try again after breeding season to switch her to rats, but she's gotten this size with this nice body condition. She's doing just fine on mice. So uh, the point is without, get, without opening that massive can of worms, uh, rats are healthier for snakes. They can get more out of a rat than they can out of a mouse of the same size. But mice are not terrible. You can grow up a snake to this size just fine as long as you're feeding them appropriately if you're feeding them mice. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in, in a minute. But just to show you, this is a mouser. I don't want to start a big debate, but let's talk about why I feed frozen thawed really quick. I choose to feed frozen thawed. There's a lot of people who successfully feed live no problem. The reason I feed frozen thawed is that, number one, I prefer that the rodent be humanely euthanized rather than attacked and killed by a snake, for one thing. Uh, it, it just is more humane to me. And uh, snakes oftentimes are injured by the, their prey item because that prey item fights back. Or they don't even try to eat the prey item at all and the rat chews on them. And I'm talking specifically about a, a thread in one of the forums just last week where a guy had dropped a rat in to the enclosure and then left for work. Now I know most people that feed live supervise, they're not gonna, they're not gonna leave. And this guy usually supervises apparently, but he came home and the rat had chewed into his snake so much that it exposed probably about that much all the way down to the snake's spine and into the bone. So, and the snake is probably not gonna survive that. Uh, infection will eventually set in and it'll be, it'll be bad news. Um, so that's really unfortunate. But uh, the fact is, even if you're supervising, a rat can easily bite a snake and cause some damage. And that's why I choose to feed frozen thawed. You know, in the wild, a snake never eats a live prey. They always eat a dead animal. Now, they, they're killing that animal right before they eat, but they're always eating a dead animal. They're going to strike, wrap, and then eat. So whether they're eating live or frozen thawed or pre-killed in captivity, they're still going to strike, wrap, and eat. And I know that there are some snakes, including I have one, who uh, doesn't necessarily need to strike and wrap. They can just you give them a rat on a plate and they'll just start eating it. Uh, it's kind of rare, but it happens. My uh, pinstripe girl, Damara, does that. But for most of these snakes, they're, you know, they're doing their behavior in the, in the wild, whether that animal was alive uh, or not right before they struck it doesn't really matter to the snake. It matters more to the rat. There are reasons that people feed live. There are reasons that people feed frozen thawed and they're all valid. It's totally fine. It's kind of whatever you want to do uh, in your collection. So that's why I called this video, this is how I feed snakes because I'm not telling you this is how you should do it. I'm just saying this is what works for me and you might be able to take some of these ideas and make them work for you as well. So, uh, Let's keep rolling. I'm going to put her back. This is a really common question that I read in the forums. My noodle Monty 
has been with me for over a year. He's 187 grams and I feed him one pinky rat every two weeks. My question is, where do I buy a female to breed him with? No, hold on champ. That is not your question. Your question is, how do I feed my snake? I will say this, based on my made up scenario, I, I was only sort of exaggerating. Um, pinky rats are probably too small for just about any snake, even right out of the egg. Now, some snakes will eat pinkies right out of the egg, but you can oftentimes do fuzzies or hoppers. Now, if you have an egg and a snake is coming out of it, you probably are not questioning what to feed it because you're already breeding snakes and you know how to feed your ball pythons. But my point is that when you get a baby snake from a breeder or a pet store or whatever, they're probably well beyond a pinky mouse stage or a pinky rat stage, definitely a pinky mouse stage. Uh, and it, they probably actually have graduated all the way to rat pups, but we'll, t we'll look at that and see what size those things are. I wanna say this though, in the wild, snakes aren't weighing themselves and weighing their prey and figuring out what the perfect size is for their exact one prey item once a week. They are, you know, raiding a, a mouse den or an ASF den or something like that. And if there's a whole bunch of little tiny ones, they might eat a bunch of them. Or if there's one big one, they might eat one big one. They might catch a bird if they're a, if they're a, um, a juvenile or a smaller male, they might be in a tree and grab a bird or a bat or something like that. That's been found in the wild. They might get a nice meal that fills their belly and then not be able to catch anything for a month. They might get something that fills their belly and then three days later find something else so they'll grab that because they're opportunistic feeders. So they're really getting a varied diet in the wild of all whatever animal they can grab. Um, a lot of people say that, that ball pythons love African soft furs, uh, ASFs, so much because that's their diet in the wild. It's part of their diet. African sufferers live in Africa, but they're gonna eat whatever they can grab. They do have a taste for African sufferers though, apparently. They're illegal in California. I've never had experience with them, but um, apparently they will take them almost all the time. But it's not, it doesn't really matter. But it's not because that's all they eat in the wild. They eat all kinds of stuff in the wild. Um, I think African sufferers are just very delicious. So when feeding your snake, in captivity, it's good to kind of remember that, that, that things don't have to be absolutely exact. And if your snake eats rats mostly, and then all of a sudden you end up with a thawed mouse because your snake Lucille refused the mouse, give it to whoever could use a mouse along with their rat diet. That's another point that I'll make is that just because your snake takes a mouse doesn't mean that it's now permanently on mice. Uh, if, you know, if you started feeding a snake mice every week for several weeks in a row, it might get hooked on mice, but I'll throw, a, I'll throw a mouse in with the inspector occasionally. If Lucille refuses a mouse and the inspector has just eaten something small, like a, like a um, weaned rat or a very small, small rat, I'll give him a, a mouse also, you know, cause he can fit that. Kent is learning about snake care and I'm trying to find things for him to do that don't involve handling snakes. So Kent, would you like to introduce your new segment? Sometimes when I'm working, I don't like to be in the snake room because I want to survive the day. So I spend a lot of time standing outside, sort of where two edges of the house meet. And that's what we're calling my new segment. We shot one yesterday. It's called Standing Outside Where Two Edges of the House Meet with Kent. Let's cut to it. Why not just call it Kent's Corner? Oh yeah, that's... Yeah, it's called Kent's Corner. I don't, why didn't I think of that? Hi, welcome to Standing Out's Kent's Corner. I'm here to talk to you about thawing out frozen rodents. In the wild, snakes use frozen rats to sharpen their teeth with, so you definitely want them thawed out. The first way to thaw out a frozen rodent is to just leave it out in the room all day. That'll thaw it out and it'll make your room smell like rats, which is super gross but it gets your snake's mind off of murdering humans for the day. So, you know. The second way of thawing out a frozen rodent is to put it in a bucket of water. This is how we do it, but wet rats are super gross. So we put them in plastic bags. And the cool thing about that is your snake is doing its thing all day, which is thinking about how to 
murder humans, and then you pop open that Ziploc bag, and you're like, rat surprise, and it recircuits their brain and gets them off thinking about humans. The third way of thawing out a frozen rat is you take it out of the freezer and you put it in your refrigerator overnight, which works really well and it thaws it out slowly. But if you want a dead rat sitting next to your meatloaf, you are super gross. Do not microwave your frozen rats. That is not the way to thaw them out. When the snake bites your frozen rat, it'll explode, which again, super gross. And plus the snake's like, you booby trapped my food. Now he's got one more reason to be mad at you. Don't microwave your rats. This has been Standing Out Kent's Corner. It's called Kent's Corner now. A new segment on the Green Room Python's YouTube channel. Thanks, Kent. That was fantastic information about thawing a frozen rodent mixed with terrible information about snakes. Thanks. All right, let me grab these frozen rats of various sizes and let's go over them. So we've got some rodents here. In general, when you're feeding your snakes, if you want them to grow, so if they're a juvenile, you do, uh, you want to give them something that's going to leave a bit of a lump in their belly. Not a massive Homer Simpson style lump, but like, like a Seth Rogen at the beach lump where you're like, dude, did you just eat four hamburgers? Do you need to lay down? Something like that, where it's not grotesque, but just, he definitely ate something, right? I'm making fun of a guy who's um, probably lighter than I am, but that's okay. He's never going to see this. All right, let's take a look at these. Uh, I just brought out what I happen to have. I don't have every size uh, rodent available, but I'll show you what I got and we'll talk about what's kind of in between these sizes. For your juvenile ball pythons, the other way to determine what size to feed is just figure 10 to 15% of their body weight. Not when they're older though, because that would be a massive animal that you're feeding them. Uh, but when they're younger, 10 to 15% of their body weight is just fine. Uh, as, as they grow, you'll know kind of when when you can start evening that out. They don't have to have a lump in their belly if they're a full-grown animal. I'll, sh I'll give you an example. Okay, let's look at these. This one, I weighed these before, so uh, I know that this is an eight gram hopper mouse. This is something that you might start a ball python off right out of the egg for its first few meals, or many ball pythons right out of the egg can start off on a fuzzy rat. So fuzzy rat has a little bit of hair. A hopper mouse has a little bit of hair. Pinkies, pinky rats don't have hair, and I think a lot of uh, baby ball pythons need that need that scent. So, you know, if they're big enough to where this one, let's see, how big was this one? This is a uh, fuzzy rat, this is 18 grams, and this is like eight, is that right? Yeah, so this is 18 grams, this is eight grams. So that's that gives you a, a idea of the difference. Check this out, here's a 36 gram weaned rat. Uh, I don't have a rat pup, but a rat pup would be somewhere in between these two sizes right here. Just don't have any. So weaned rat, here's a jumbo mouse, about the same size as a weaned rat. So to feed an adult ball python jumbo mice, you need to get a few in their belly before it's a meal. Here's a small rat. The small rat is 66 grams. Now. The different suppliers that you'll get rodents from will name their different sized rats, different things, but, but they're pretty going to be pretty close to this. But watch this. Molly Malone here is probably 425 to 450 grams. I know she's well over 400 grams. And she could eat a rodent that's probably up to 65 grams or something like that. Uh, but let's, let's look at this based on her, the thickest part of her belly, okay? So here's, here's a weaned rat that would be less than 10% of her body weight. And that, it's hard to tell with the camera, but um, this weaned rat thawed out would be thinner than, than her, her belly. This small rat, this looks like a big meal for her. But when I, when I compare the belly, let's see, can you guys see that? When I compare that, it's about the same size and thawed out, this is kind of a, you know, when the, when the animal is, is uh, frozen, they, they're kind of mushed, like, what's the word, scrunched a little bit. So they might be a little fatter than 
when I when this is thawed out. In fact, she's going to eat today. She might take this. I might I might use this one for her. So that's going to be a good meal for her. That's going to leave a good sized lump in her belly. This is a small, small rat. There are, there's a variety of sizes of what they call small rats. This one's a, a relatively small one. Uh, there's ones that are bigger in my small rat bag that Molly Malone would not be able to take. And this might be on the cusp. I might go a little bit smaller. I might grab one that's a little smaller than this, um, but bigger than this. So somewhere in between for her today. This is a 97 gram medium rat. The grams don't matter at this point. We're not worried about weight when we're feeding adults. Many adult ball pythons never go beyond a small rat. You know, they'll get, they'll get one or two small rats. Mediums though, for the big girls, work just fine. Now, check this out. Here's Freya, big fat girl. This rat is much smaller than her body. That's okay. I don't need to put a lump in Freya when she eats. Now she's off food right now because she's, she's a follicle building mama, but when she's on food during the non uh, middle of breeding season, she, uh, she would take a medium rat. If she's, you know, if she's super breeding and, and pounding food, she's going to take probably two medium rats, but one of these every couple of weeks is fine for her to maintain. Um, now again, we're kind of, we're, I, I don't want to get so much into, into feeding breeding females cause that's different. And if you're breeding your snakes, you probably know about that already. Um, this is more for, for your pets or for your non-breeding animals and for a non-breeding animal that's, you know, full grown, you don't need them to keep growing and keep growing and keep growing. So this rat once every 10 days, 14 days, something like that is, is just fine. Um, now my pinstripe girl, who's even bigger when she's, she'll, she'll take a medium rat each time I feed her, but then in breeding season, she's taking two mediums and a small, uh, so they can fit a lot more, but that doesn't mean that they need to fit a lot more. You know, you don't, the most people that keep ball pythons in captivity are keeping them way bigger than they need to, than they need to be. Most of these snakes are way overweight. So they don't have to eat a massive meal every time, especially when they're already full grown. Now with the inspector, this is his size rat all day long. Occasionally I'll feed him one of these or maybe two of these, you know, let's say I run out of smalls and I, and I ordered some and they're not going to be here for a week, but he's, it's his feeding day and I've got some weaned. I'll give him two weaned, no problem. Or I'll give him a weaned and a mouse, especially if Lucille refuses her mouse. That's no problem. Occasionally it's, you know, it's good for the most part to give them one appropriate size prey item on a normal interval, but to change that interval slightly occasionally and to switch up the prey item from mice to rats, I'm not saying go out and get a bunch of chicks or quail or whatever necessarily, but, but mice to rats, if you have ASFs that, that might be cool too. Uh, like I said, I don't really have experience with that, but, um, I don't have a problem occasionally feeding a snake a mouse who normally eats rats. And I also don't have a problem occasionally feeding two smaller prey items instead of one larger one, especially if, if it works for what happens to be in my freezer. Last week I ended up with an extra rat and I had fed all the snakes that I was going to feed and I had one about this big, a weaned, a weaned rat. And the inspector came out of his hide looking for a snack as he always does when there's rat smell in the room, but he had just eaten three days earlier. He could have totally taken a weaned rat, no problem. But the problem is that that would start his digestive process all over again. And digestion in snakes is a big deal. Uh, so once that started, you want to just let that happen. It takes about five days. They say, you know, don't handle your snake for about 48 hours after they've eaten 48 to 72. Uh, and the reason is that's the major part of the digestion and you want to eat, eat you know, you want that to happen without them being disturbed and, uh, you want to lessen the chances of regurgitation, but also they, when they've started that process, you don't want to start it all over again, three days later and, and have them go through that again. It's not, it's not a digestion system like ours. Let's talk about that real quick. The reason that snakes go dormant for a couple days after they've eaten is because the internal snake is doing all kinds of crazy stuff and the external snake needs to relax while that happens. All the energy is going toward 
digesting that meal. Uh, there are really strong stomach acids that are breaking down fur and bone and things like that. The organs of the snake, I've seen some studies that say that the organs, including the heart, double in size. I don't know if that's the case. That's in Burmese pythons. I don't know if that's the case with ball pythons, but I know that their organs do expand. There's a lot going on inside that snake when they're digesting. So uh, that's, some, that's why I don't want to kick off that process again three days later by giving the inspector a snack when he wants a snack in, in you know, three days after he ate. When a snake eats a meal, they are at their most vulnerable. They've got prey in their mouth. They can't quickly drop it to defend themselves and, bite and you know, use their mouth to bite or defend themselves. So it's a really vulnerable time for the snake eating the meal, but then because they have to kind of go dormant, digesting that meal, the time that it takes to digest the meal, especially the first few days, is a really vulnerable time for the snake as well. That's the psychology behind the rules that we have as snake keepers, like you need to have plenty of hides in, in your enclosure. The snake needs to feel comfortable. And if they'll eat in their enclosure, that means that they feel comfortable enough to make themselves vulnerable and eat. I have some snakes that will eat with me standing right there watching them. Like Lucille, my pied, I can give her a mouse and sit there and she'll eat the mouse right there with me watching her. She feels totally and completely comfortable with me right there. If I feed Freya, I have to close her tub and she needs privacy to eat, otherwise she won't eat. And if she's feeling uncomfortable, she'll drop the, the prey. So different snakes are different, but the fact is they need to feel comfortable. That's a very vulnerable time for them. And so if, you're, if your husbandry is not on point, if you don't have enough hides for them, or if you don't have enough heat, you know, if it's not warm enough for them to digest their prey, they won't eat. Uh, they, you know, that's one of the reasons that you need a hot spot is they have to have that external warmth to digest. If they can't digest, that prey item is going to rot in their gut and it'll kill them. So there are reasons that snakes won't eat, you know, and uh, figuring out what those are and fixing your husbandry is important. I'm going to do a whole, I think I'll do a whole video about reasons why your snake won't eat and things you can do to fix that. That might be, that could be next week's video. Let me know if you want to see that and I'll rush it out if you guys, if you guys are into it. Uh, we'll make it next week's video. Otherwise I'll do it somewhere down the line, but I think that's a whole video in itself. So I sort of touched on my schedule of feeding, but, but basically if it's a small snake, they get fed every five to seven days. Uh, yeah, every five, if they are under 300 grams for me. I mean, you can go every, you can go every seven days easily for, you know, from hatchling, but I go every five days until they're about 300 grams. Then I switch to once a week. And then once they're sub adult to adult, we'll go like every 10 days or something like that. Breeding season is totally different. Um, but we're just talking about under normal circumstances. That's the schedule that I use, but definitely a, a large adult snake doesn't need to be eating a large meal every single week, you know, um, but change it up, get, give them a meal two weeks in a row and then skip a couple weeks and then go 10 days and, and get, you know, change up your sizes of meals, things like that. That's, that's great for them. Brand new snakes. This is very important. And it's something I'm dealing with right now, because if you saw last week's video, you saw Ron, my new snake, Ron just ate for the first time yesterday. Uh, with me. It was the first time trying to get him to eat and he ate. I didn't think he was going to because he's been, I've had him in his quarantine enclosure for a week. I haven't touched him, haven't messed with him except to go in and change his water dish. And anytime I do that, he's real scared. Uh, understandably so, but it made me think that he might not be comfortable enough in that enclosure yet to eat. Uh, but I gave him a live rat and he took it right away. No problem. Why did I give him a live rat? I don't feed live. I feed frozen thawed. The reason is that when you get a new snake, ask the breeder or the pet shop or whatever, what that snake is eating, whatever that is, that's what you feed them. At least for the first meal, maybe for the first few meals, because you want to give that snake the best opportunity to eat right away and, and not get them sort of on the wrong foot of refusing meals immediately when, when you bring them home. So give them what they're used to eating and let that snake establish itself in that enclosure where it goes, all right, this is a safe space for me. This is where food that I'm used to seeing gets delivered to me and I can eat my food here. So once they've taken 
a meal that's whatever that, that breeder or pet shop or whatever has been feeding them, then you can start changing them over to whatever you want them to eat. So next week, what I'll do is gently offer him a frozen thawed. I'll do it on a day that I'm feeding my other snakes. I'll have rat scent in the room. I'll scent his tub with, with rat so that he smells it. And if I see him hunting, I'll offer that frozen thawed. If I don't, if he has no reaction, you know, and even if he, if he's not hunting, I'll still pop it in there and see if there's a reaction, but I'm not going to sit there and bop it on his nose or do any crazy stuff and stress him out. I'll just offer it. If he doesn't take it, that's fine. I'll give him a live. And I'll do that probably three weeks in a row before I really start, you know, uh, doing some other techniques to try to get him to eat frozen thawed, um, which I will talk about in my next video about what some of those techniques are if you're trying to switch your, your snakes or just get your snakes to eat. Wow, this has been a long one. I can tell because I'm starting to lose my voice. I hope that Future Bob is able to find enough cuts in editing to where this isn't a seven hour video. I've cut out most of the boring parts and all the nudity. Kent, thanks so much for Kent's Corner. Really enjoyed that. Why don't you do the sign off? Thank you for... Thank you for watching Kent's Corner, a new segment in the Green Room Pythons video. I'm glad that you enjoyed it and come back for more Kent's Corner. And hit the like button. We are going to work on that sign off. Folks, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.